So, healthy Thursday morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, good evening, good midday. At any point in time where you are, I'd like to tell everyone that we're doing this. This is my own way of supporting everyone who have um, really worked their ass out in response to this uh, pandemic. And uh, rest assured, I'm going to do this regularly for free and you're going to get learning resources. So before anything else, I'd like to announce that 10 lucky colleagues will get a learning package from me today, okay? So I will explain the mechanics later. The learning package would include, okay, uh, a complete set of my books, okay? So I'm giving away 10 packages today, okay? Uh -oh, mamaya tayo, parang raffle yan towards the end, okay? And, um, well, we'll be speaking in English today because um, there are people who are joining us and they don't speak Filipino. So I would be translating some of our um, Filipino words into English so that they would be able to understand us, okay? So if you have any questions, please do use our chat box and I would answer them after every segment. So today's session will be divided into three segments, okay? And it will be divided according to how you were given the PDF file. So I just hope you printed it out so that you have a copy with you. That's gonna be your guide. Para hindi ka sulat na sulat, you have time to listen to me, okay? Now, if I can't read and answer all your questions today, because you know, I know for a fact, Okay, that you also have something to do, send me your questions through this email, mentor.raygapos at gmail.com after okay, our session. And I would gladly give you my answers through email. Okay, now if you have some requested topics which you may want me to cover in our future sessions, because um, Medjo, you're having difficulty understanding the concept, you want me to simplify it for you, please feel free to send me a note. Okay, so let's start our day right. Let's begin with goal setting. What is our goal today? Our goal today is to understand how are we supposed to study concepts that we need to focus on the test. It's not the what, because you get the what from social media groups, from Google, in the almost everything that you'll find on the internet, you have it. So our focus is on the how, because sometimes when you are faced with a question in front of your screen while taking the end clicks, you would know the facts related to the concept, but it's difficult for you to convert the facts into strategies. So the how of doing things would be our focus for today. So we're gonna start with that goal. You have to know how to do the test, or you have to know how to convert what you know to answer questions properly, okay? I, I was the one who actually um, have chosen the concepts I've given out to everyone through the PDF file you received. And um, actually this portion on goal setting brings to mind a, a very uh, um, thought-provoking, okay, but also at the same time, very funny anecdote, okay, about what is supposed to be our goal in life. Let me start with that question, okay? So our goal is to always keep our dreams alive. And how do we do that? Keep your dream, not just in your mind, but more importantly, in your heart. And for every heartbeat that you hear, let it remind you of that dream, especially if your dream is to be a U.S. registered nurse, okay? So I'd like to share with you a short anecdote. A little boy was once asked by his teacher, what's your dream? And he answered, like my dad, I want to earn a million a month, okay? So the teacher was impressed and she remarked, wow, is that how much your father earns a month? And the boy answered, no, ma'am. It's also his dream. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pareho lang pala nilang pangarap yon. But even if the father did not achieve that dream, at least the son is working towards that same dream. And if we actually pursue our dreams relentlessly, eventually we're going to achieve it. So always remember 
what the mind conceives, ah, uh -uh, it's no longer the body achieves, okay? But psychologists now have identified a connection between the mind and the body. And so if you're going to fill in the blanks, that's saying what the mind conceives, the body believes, okay? So if you believe that you will pass the test, eventually all actions or bodily actions that you will have will be geared towards that goal. So that's our goal for today. Work on our dream. Okay, so what's new? Let's start with what's new, okay? With the present pandemic, can you imagine being in a class like this if we're going to do face-to-face? -face? How claustrophobic, right? <laughs> okay. Or if you want to have a tutor, do you imagine meeting like this? <laughs> okay. It's a little high-tech. Okay. Or having your PE class in protective bubble suits. It's not what happening, what's happening in um, grade school and senior and junior high school. They're having their PE class in protective bubble suits and they play like this. So a lot of change in terms of how we deliver information. And I'm just so glad that through this Zoom meeting, I'm able to reach out to you guys, okay? So what's the latest? Let's begin. So the new NCLEX RN, effective October 1, 2020, there's a new portion. You're going to have a 15-item pretest, but the pretest will not be scored. It will not affect your pass or fail um, performance or decision related to your performance in the test. In, in other words, they just separated the experimental questions, which previously were integrated into the NCLEX test. So right now, the unscored or the, not, uh, the, the items that are not scored are no longer integrated into the main test. So that is an advantage. Um, what's the purpose of the 15 item pretest? Well, they are being validated okay, and tested for reliability. And these items, if they pass the validity and reliability test, would become test items for the NCLEX in the future, okay? Now, the run out of time rule is no longer applicable. So you don't have to worry about the run out of time rule, okay? So the minimum number of scored items is already 60 and the maximum is 130. And you are given five bars for the test. Five bars for 130, you have more than enough, okay? Now, the minimum now is no longer 75 because they actually removed the 15 item, experimental items in from the main test and converted it to the items for the pretest. Therefore, anyone can now claim that they shut down the NCLEX at 60 minimum items. Wow. But never believe it when somebody said that he shut down the NCLEX at 50. Of course, that's not um, recognized because the minimum scored item should be 60. If somebody shuts down the NCLEX at 50, it simply means one thing. Okay, there was power outage. Okay, so nag brown out. So that I maglokohan. Okay, so let's move on. Let's begin our journey. I'm so excited. Okay, so one of the things that a lot of nurses are having difficulty at the point at this moment at this point in time is actually trying to figure out how to establish priorities because sometimes we prepare with the things we want to learn. We don't prepare aligning what we should learn from the test framework. That's where the problem is. What do I mean by that? Sometimes when, when our friends would tell us, please do study concepts on establishing priorities. So we focus on who should we admit first? Who should we assess first? Well, in most instances, that could be the appropriate way of studying, but always think and have the what if mentality. What if NCLEX will not ask about the priorities for admission? What if instead NCLEX will ask about, uh, ask a question about the priorities for this child? Like, here's an example. After an earthquake, the nurse has just finished assessing the clients in the ward. Which client should the nurse discharge first to make way for a new admission? Now, this has a lot of implications at this point because, you know, hospitals now are getting burdened with a lot of admission because of the COVID-19 disease. So, let's figure out the options. One, a client who delivered by cesarean section four hours ago. Two, a client post cerebrospinal fluid analysis. 
three, a client post ultrasound, and four, a client who is due for discharge the next day. So this is kind of a difficult question because you have to analyze it. And when you analyze it, your strategy should be back by protocols. And in this case, you need a knowledge of the protocol in terms of uh, making way for uh, new admission when the hospital is overwhelmed, when there's a disaster. Now to do that, okay, so let's actually go back to what we're talking about. So let's move on. So what happens when the test would deal with prioritizing in terms of discharging clients and not in terms of admitting clients. So here's a functional concept. A functional concept serves as a guide for you to answer questions. That is actually a registered trademark of the Regapo system. So here's an example. To make way for a vacant bed during major disasters, consider discharging the following clients. Remember the three Ds. The client who delivered 24 hours ago, the client who is due for discharge within the day and the client who is done with the diagnostic test but is not bedridden. So pay particular attention to the fact that clients who have undergone diagnostic tests, which requires them to stay in bed, should never be considered as a priority for discharge. So having this knowledge in mind, you have this in your hand up. Let's apply this. Let's use this concept in answering a question. That's what I meant when I say, how do you use your concepts to answer questions? Okay. So let's go back to the question. After an earthquake, the nurse has just finished assessing the clients in the ward. Which client should the nurse discharge first to make way for a new admission? So a client who delivered by cesarean section four hours ago, uh, that's supposed to be normal delivery, okay? Okay, um, and that's the delivery should have been at least 24 hours, not four hours ago. Okay, two, a client post CSF analysis. Well, um, gathering the specimen for cerebrospinal fluid requires lumbar top. And that would actually require the patient to stay in bed for six to eight hours after. So what did we say a while back in our functional concept? Well, patients who have undergone diagnostic tests and are not bedridden could be a priority. In this case, the patient will be bedridden. Okay. Three, a client post ultrasound, we can consider knowing that there's no actually a restriction after ultrasound. Number four, a client is due for discharge the next day. What did we say about our functional concept? We can discharge the patient who is due for discharge within the day, not for the next day. So the correct answer for this question definitely is number three, a client post ultrasound. Okay. Now, even if you remember the three Ds, for establishing priorities for discharging a patient, never, ever, ever forget the principle of ABC, prioritizing patients with problems of, related to airway, breathing, and circulation. However, once again, sometimes questions may not reflect this directly. You wouldn't have questions that would really ask you which of the following patients would have airway problems and should therefore be priority. Questions are not phrased like that. So questions are actually phrased um, in such a way that you need to analyze. You need to um, read through the options one by one and eventually pick a correct answer. So let's have an example. Okay. Here's an example that covers a concept of prioritizing. Remember your ABC airway breathing population. In the emergency department, which of the following clients should the nurse consider as a priority? Now, when you're faced with a question like this, you have to focus on the context. What do I mean by context? The setting. Here the setting is the emergency department. So the setting is the emergency department, okay? So if you are in the emergency department, remember, NCLEX is Ivory Tower Nursing. You have the equipment, you have the personnel, you have what you need to attend to the client's needs. Therefore, you have to remember the concept, you prioritize a patient who would need interventions related to airway, breathing, and circulation. Okay, now, to do that, we have to analyze the options one by one. One 30-year-old client with puncture wound on the left leg complaining of pain. Now, this patient actually is manifesting a symptom that is expected because of the condition, which is a puncture wound. Definitely, you'll have pain. So remember, the functional concept of a client who exhibits 
a manifestation that is typical or expected in a condition is not considered as a priority. And take note, in the hierarchy of problems, pain is not considered as a physiologic problem. It is considered as a psychosocial problem. So definitely that's not the answer. Two, 45 year old with pancreatitis complaining of abdominal pain. Once again, pain is a common manifestation expected in a client with pancreatitis. What did we say a while back? A patient who exhibits a manifestation that is expected in a condition is not considered a priority. Three, a 23 year old is having follow up for abuse of pain relievers. This time, this is a psychosocial problem. It's not a physiologic problem. So we can let that go. And let's proceed to number four, an 18 year old who has taken an overdose of opioids. Now, how do we connect the use of opioids with problems in airway, breathing and circulation? Remember for a fact that your opioids may cause respiratory depression. Okay, that's the reason why for example, if your patient is taking a medication, like for example, morphine, there's always the antidote at the bedside, naloxone hydrochloride, okay? So your opioids has the potential to depress the respiratory muscles, therefore leading now to problems related to either airway or breathing. So remember your A, B, C. So if you're taking the test, you would notice that it's not actually something that's very direct, okay? So focus on that, okay? Are you learning so far, colleagues? Okay, give me a thumbs up sign if you are. Okay, okay. So test taking key therefore, give it time. If you notice, we went through each option. We never pick an answer without analyzing all the four options. So that's the first taking test taking key that I'd like to highlight. You always give each question time. And from our students who actually passed the test, they shut down the minimum number of items within like, at least two and a half to three hours. So that simply means it takes them 10 to 15 minutes for each question before they move on to the next, okay? So pay particular attention to this test taking key, give it time, okay? So remember, if you work hard, give it time. Don't give up, things will always get better. Always remember at this point in time, remember, don't give up, things will always get better. Let's keep that in our hearts, okay? So I'd like to share with you um, this, the story of this lady. She's Miss Pasita Riville. And as you would notice, that was me. <laughs> Some people think it was my father. <laughs> That's the Ray Gapos pre da Vicky Bello surgeries. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not actually, I'd like to share that. Well, Vicky Bello work on my forehead to add on here, here. Um, she worked on my cheekbones, she worked on my eyes, and she worked on my body too. Okay, which means you did have liposuction. Yeah, okay. So if you're going to look at my face previously from my face now, who looks younger. <laughs> okay, but this was actually taken approximately like 15 years ago. See, I look older 15 years ago. Well, anyway, that's plugging my friend's Vicky's skills, okay? One thing I can, you can be sure of with Vicky is that she knows beauty, okay? She knows what to do to bring out the best in your facial features. I'm not ashamed of that fact that I've had my face done, okay? Okay, so that's actually one trivial thing <laughs> about me. I'd like to share it with you guys because I want to treat you as my friends. I'd like to see you here regularly, okay? So let's share knowledge and uh, inspirational thoughts every time we have sessions like this. Okay, so what was the story of Pasita Reveal? She came to me at age 61 and she wanted to pass her test. In the olden days, you have to pass a CGFNS test before going to the end taking the NPLEX in the States. And she came to me and I did an assessment. And lo and behold, what I discovered about Pasita is that at age 61, she had four surgeries, okay? She had a craniotomy because of ruptured aneurysm. She had um, developed a hydrocephalus after that, adult onset. That's why they actually implanted a tube okay, to drain the excess CSF from the, from the brain, okay, into 
the system. So the second one is actually for the implantation of the drainage tube for the adult onset hydrocephalus. The third one, she had thyroidectomy. Notice these three surgeries are all major surgeries. Just imagine the effect of anesthesia it had on Pasita. And the fourth was that, you know what's the surgery that she had? She had a surgery to release a compression of the median nerve because she had carpal tunnel syndrome. Remember, carpal tunnel syndrome is actually due to co the compression of the median nerve, okay? And it's common in females, okay? Who had overuse wrist. So you also see it in plumbers. You also see it in typists, in stenographers, those people who have overuse wrist. Now, let me ask you, what could have caused Pasita to develop carpal tunnel syndrome? You know, I can only think of one data from her personal bio, okay, that could be related to why she overused her wrist and developed carpal tunnel syndrome. You know what is that? <laughs> well, at age 61, Pasita was still single. Okay, so that explains, okay. <laughs> Well, I'm not saying anything. I'm leaving it to your imagination, guys. But you know, one thing I'd like you to, <laughs> to remember about this story is that it's very inspiring. Why? Remember at age 61, with one week of mentoring that we did in Cebu, Pasita actually passed her test. And when she actually arrived in the stage, she wrote me a very long letter sharing with me her experiences and her dream of at least visiting her mother's grave in the U.S. And she was able to do that because she passed her test. Okay. So we have all our reasons for doing the test that we're preparing for, specifically the NCLEX RN. So despite, okay, despite the anesthesia that were used, okay, in the surgeries of Pasita, Okay, take note, take note, okay? <laughs> she passed the test. That's because she believed she can. So in relation to that, let's proceed now with the next concept. And the next concept is actually about the lobes of the brain. Now, a lot of you guys who are actually studying for the test would do this, okay? You identify frontal lobe, and then what are the functions? And you identify parietal lobe, then what are the functions? Temporal lobe, then what are the functions? Then occipital lobe, what's the function? And then after that, you forget about it, okay? Now, when you're preparing for the NCLEX, it's always nice to have mnemonics, something that would really tell you and remind you about <laughs> something that would really the different things that you need to remember, specifically on this concept, which is actually the lobes of the brain, okay? For example, for the frontal lobe, what do we need to remember? The three Ps, okay? It's actually considered as the seat of personality. It's the part of the brain responsible for problem solving and for planning. Therefore, if a patient, for example, with Alzheimer's disease develops personality changes like rigidity, what lobe of the brain will be affected? Definitely, you will have to answer frontal lobe. But remember, you always have to have that what-if mentality on the n clicks. They're not, they're not going to be so precise. And they acknowledge for the fact that you might know these functions as a basic concept because you've done this in your undergrad. Therefore, they will make the question a notch higher. If they will ask you now to click on the part of the brain that is affected in a patient with personality changes. So knowing that that's going to be frontal lobe, then click on letter A. Okay, so that's what we call exhibit. A little difficult, right? Yeah, okay. So let's move on. For parent parietal lobe, sorry for that, it's responsible for pain interpretation, sensations like touch, temperature, pressure, and taste, reading, and arithmetic. So this is also the part of the brain that's responsible for the sense of orientation. So SPO, sensation, pain interpretation, or pain perception, and orientation. So parietal lobe is labeled B in this illustration. So if you will have a client who is disoriented, click on the part of the brain that reflects the part of the brain that is affected in the disoriented client, and you will have to click on letter B. Clear? Okay, we're learning fast. Now, what about temporal lobes? Okay, temporal lobes, here's where you have your auditory center or Wernick's language area where you process information and understand it. And this is where you have the function of, take note, memory. Although some anatomy books would usually tell you that 
memory is a co-function of the temporal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. You have to pay particular attention to the fact that learning resources at this point would actually attribute your memory function to the temporal lobe. That's why you say in Tagalog, hindi ko maisip yung point here, right? Hindi mo naman sinasabi, hindi ko maisip din yung point occipital lobe, no. You point here. So I can think of the answer, you point here. So you're trying to remember memory, okay? And then occipital lobe would be visual processing. So when you were doing your quizzes back in your elementary school days, and if your answer came from your occipital lobe, that simply meant you've seen the answer of your seatmate, <laughs> okay? You, you process visually, so nangopia ka. So if your answer is coming from the occipital lobe, that's visual processing. Or you heard your answer from a classmate behind you, so your answer therefore came from your temporal lobe. But if you solve the problem yourself, you tried to analyze it, okay? Then you did problem solving. So we can say that when you answer questions related to prioritizing, that's problem solving, okay? You are answering from your frontal lobe. But if you're answering math problems, dosage and calculations, you're answering from your parietal lobe, okay? Okay, so for you not to forget, let me give you a basic guide, okay? Now, if you talk about, remember, the lobes of the brain focus on the functions that are frequently used on a daily basis, okay? Daily basis. Like, for example, the frontal lobe, okay? Motor speech area. So you talk because of the function of your frontal lobe. So you can say, everybody, point out to your forehead, I can talk. I can talk. I can talk. Okay? Okay. And then, if, okay, if you want to focus on your skill of reading, okay, reading is a function of parietal lobe. So everybody, let's point on our parietal lobe, I can read. So I can talk, I can talk, forehead, I can read, Okay, I can read. And then your temporal lobe is actually, okay, responsible for hearing and understanding. So I can talk, I can read, I can hear, I can understand, I can see. I can see. Everybody, I can talk, I can talk, I can read, I can read, I can hear, I can understand, I can see. So, well, you can sing a song with it, okay? I can talk, I can read, and touch the rainbow in the sky. <laughs> I can be your good friend. I can love you until the end. Okay, done with it. I just hope I was able to share with you something which will actually make you remember the functions of the lobes of the brain and which of these functions you need to remember for your test. Now, let's move on a little further. Now, remember to keep the what-if mentality when you're preparing for the NCLEX. What did I tell you a while back? I told you that NCLEX would know what you are anticipating. So give it some more. Push yourself behind what's basic. So at this point in time, what if the NCLEX would ask me about expressive aphasia and receptive aphasia. How do we relate these abnormalities in terms of the functions of the lobes of the brain? Okay, so what did we say a while back? Frontal lobe, Broca's motor speech area, I can talk, right? Okay, and then temporal lobe, I can hear, I can understand. This is where your Wernick's language area is. Now, what is the problem in expressive aphasia? In expressive aphasia, the problem is the inability of the patient to find the right words to write or say. Okay. So in Tagalog, hindi niya masabi yung salita or hindi niya maisulat yung salita. We say expressive aphasia, both spoken and written. Okay, therefore, if the patient is unable to say the right words, so what part of the brain could have been affected? Okay, it has affected the frontal lobe, specifically Broca's area. Okay, specifically Broca's area. Okay, next important thing to remember, 
So what did we say about expressive aphasia? The patient is unable to say or write words, okay? Therefore, what should be your priority intervention? You have to facilitate communication. That's your priority. Facilitate communication, and the way to do it is actually to use a picture board. Give them a set of pictures that they can show, like a picture of a glass, okay? So that if they can say it, they can just show the picture. So this is what we call communication aids. Right now, communication aids have gone high tech. You could actually order it and download the pictures that you need to communicate to your family members, okay? And have it in your iPad or iPhone, okay? The world really changed rapidly, okay? And maybe you could potentially Use close-ended questions, questions that will not ask the client to explain, questions that will be answerable with yes or no, and they can just verbally, non-verbally answer it by nodding the head to say yes or shaking it to say no. But once again, let's acknowledge that uh, our Indian brothers and sisters shaking the head sideways could actually mean yes, okay? So that's a cultural um, difference from what is commonly understood non-verbally. Okay, so how is expressive aphasia different from receptive aphasia? Okay, in expressive aphasia, the frontal lobe is affected, the broadest motor speech area is affected, the client is unable to say or write words, okay? In receptive aphasia, okay, this is actually the inability of the patient to understand, okay? To understand. So they are hearing you, they are seeing you, but they can't process the information that you're giving them. Therefore, okay, which part of the brain is affected? What did we say a while back? Okay, we hear, we understand, uh, based on the function of the Wernicke's language area, the temporal lobe. So it's a temporal lobe that's affected, the Wernicke's language area is affected, therefore, how should we deal with this patient? Once again, the priority is to promote communication. And to do that, since it takes time for the patient to process information, you have to talk to the patient slowly. Okay, is it good if I try to finish the sentences for them? No, you don't do that, okay? That's not actually uh, indicated. So give the patient time to speak. Do not finish the sentences for the patient, but you may use gestures and facial ex expressions instead. So remember, frontal lobe, Broca's area, expressive aphasia. Temporal lobe, Wernicke's area, receptive aphasia, okay? So don't forget these differences. Okay, but in both instances, our priority, always remember the concept of priority. Okay, our priority should be, remember, to initiate and facilitate communication. Okay, so let's move on. Are you learning class? Please give me a note on our chat box if I'm moving too fast so that I could actually um, slow down a bit for you. I do acknowledge some um, idiosyncrasies and difficulties with the internet connection. So please feel free to send me a message, okay? Next, let's move on with the functional concept. Alexic anomnia is caused by stroke characterized by inability to understand written words despite being able to write. So um, this is what alexic anomnia is. The patient is able to write, but they are unable to understand written words. And this is associated with so once again, the priority for alexic anomia is definitely initiating and facilitating communication. Okay. Now, here's another functional concept. Sorry for that. A patient with aphasia should be referred to the speech language therapist. Okay. So even a patient with dysphagia should also be referred to the speech language therapist because they need to have exercises specifically on the muscles that would facilitate speech, okay? So don't forget, to whom should you refer? Remember, the speech language therapist is a member of the multidisciplinary team. Now let's move on to something new. Okay, everybody who knows how to pronounce this <laughs> will get a learning pack from me. No, that's a joke. That's not the way how to do it. I'm going to announce how you get um, a learning pack from me. I'm giving away 10 learning packages today. Okay, to our colleagues who are with us, okay? This is pronounced von Gerke syndrome or von Gerke disease. Have you ever heard of this? Nah, -uh. nah. -uh. But are you familiar with the condition where there is blood sugar level below 50 milligrams per deciliter? Is that categorical enough? Yes, so we're talking about a condition characterized by hypoglycemia. But 
what the hell is von Gerke syndrome? Okay, so before I explain what von Gerke syndrome is, let me explain the main problem. Okay, in von Gerke syndrome, the main problem is actually in the glycogen metabolism pathway. Okay, so let me explain it briefly so you'll answer, you'll understand it. We know for a fact that glycogen, okay, which is your uh, coming from carbohydrates processed in the body, is stored in the liver and the skeletal muscles for future use. Okay, now when glycogen is needed, there's a process known as glycogenolysis in which, okay, glucose is released from the body cell to supply the body's need. So you prevent hypoglycemia. Now, which facilitates the conversion of your glycogen to glucose? This is due to the presence of glucose 6-phosphatase translocase. This is the enzyme that facilitates the conversion of glycogen to glucose in, in a process known as glycogenolysis. Now, what happens? In von Gerke disease, there is a deficiency of the enzymes of the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase translocase. You don't have this enzyme in von Gerke disease. Therefore, what happens? Well, the stored glycogen is never converted to glucose. So your body now will lack supply of glucose. Thus, what results? Salad hypoglycemia. Okay. And what are usually the common signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia? Now, you know for a fact that there's going to be hypoglycemia when there is what? Number one, diaphoresis or cold sweats. Okay. Difficulty in problem solving. Okay. Difficulty in problem solving and decreased level of consciousness. So those three characterizes hypoglycemia. Okay, so let's move on. Functional concept. Von Gerke disease is characterized by hypoglycemia. Okay, and it's transmitted through autosomal recessive pattern. Now let me explain autosomal recessive pattern. So which simply means for the children to have 25% chance of having the disease, both parents should carry that trait for von Gerke disease. Okay? So if it's transmitted autosomal recessive pattern, both parents should carry the trait such that when both parents are carrier of the trait, 25%, there's 25% chance of the children of having the disease. Therefore, what will this family with von Gerke disease need? You need to refer them to A, and that's a potential question, a geneticist, because they need genetic counseling for them to understand how this disease could be transmitted within the family. Okay, so let's move on. So von Gerke disease is manifested by, remember, high blown, heat intolerance, bruising too easily, low blood sugar, overly swollen belly, Okay, so weak muscles and muscle pain and cramps during exercise and not growing fast enough. In other words, let's visualize. Here's a patient who is unable to withstand heat. They frequently have bruising or bleeding and they have dizziness because of low blood sugar. And they have something which we frequently see in front of our full body mirror every day. What is that? Swollen belly. <laughs> We get to see this every day when we look at ourselves after taking a bath in front of our full body mirror, right? That's one of the effects of the lockdown related to uh, the community quarantine that's actually being implemented here in our country and to our friends abroad, okay? We wish you well. We hope you, we could work on, once again, reducing our waistlines after the pandemic is over, okay? So don't forget von Gerke disease, hypoglycemia. It's genetically transmitted, so you have to refer the patient to a geneticist. Okay, now, in terms of laboratory data, if you will actually have the what-if mentality, what if the test would ask him out, me about laboratory findings in a patient with von Gerke disease? Okay, so what's important is that you have to know what are the findings? So definitely there's going to be your 4-H, hypoglycemia, hyperuricemia, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, then lactic acidosis and neutropenia or agranulocytosis, so H, L, and N. In relation to this, you have to know the normal values 
of the essential laboratory data. Now, if you talk about how will I study von Gerke disease, this is how you will study von Gerke disease. Take note. You have to have a working knowledge of targeted treatment, okay? How do we treat a patient with von Gerke disease? The main problem that we have is hypoglycemia. Therefore, what do we tell the patient? Avoid fasting. You have to have frequent small feeding with complex carbohydrates that's low in fructose and sucrose diet and NGT feedings for infants. And we can use cornstarch for frequent feeding. Why? Well, your cornstarch helps delay stomach emptying, thus decreasing hypoglycemia. Okay, then for lactic acidosis, we administer oral citrate or bicarbonate to neutralize the acidotic state. For hyperuricemia, administer colchicin and allopurinol. Definitely, uh, your allopurinol will help decrease your uric acid, okay? And your colchicin will promote excretion of uric acid. Hyperlipidemia, we have to administer your statins, levastatins, atorvastatin, simvastatin, usually with dinner. Okay, remember that your statins are hepatotoxic. So instruct the patient to have frequent liver function tests. And we could actually also uh, recommend the use of fish oil. And for persistent microalbuminuria, which simply means there's albumin in the urine, this is usually treated with ACE inhibitor because your albuminuria could be related to renal hypertension, which could be treated with ACE inhibitor, okay? So what do we tell the patient to expect? Echocardiography every three years after the age of 10, liver function tests every six to 12 months, vitamin D monitoring, and dual energy x-ray absonometry scan. Okay, now, having that knowledge in mind, okay, what is important for us to remember is how will the, the, the test ask about these concepts, okay? So we move on to the next concept. What could be some complications of von Gerke disease? Well, you have bleeding disorders, osteoporosis, and fracture. You have renal failure, menorrhagia, and polycystic ovaries, gout, Crohn's disease like enterocolitis, and hypothyroidism. Pay particular attention to the renal failure. Remember, it could potentially lead to renal hypertension causing albuminuria. And of course, you have to monitor for the development of osteoporosis. Okay? Now, here's a sample question. Okay, which of the following laboratory findings are found in a patient with von Gerke disease? Okay, von Gerke disease or von Gerke syndrome. So blood sugar level of 180 milligrams per deciliter. Now, this is a question that's difficult to answer if you don't know your normal values. You know for a fact, we know for a fact that hypoglycemia occurs, but which value would actually classify as hypoglycemia? Definitely 180 milligrams per deciliter is elevated blood sugar. It's hyperglycemia because the normal blood sugar level could be between 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. At 126 milligrams per deciliter, it's already considered borderline or pre-diabetic stage, okay? So, so we put an X for number one, absolute neutrophil count of 1,000, okay? The absolute neutrophil count is usually computed from the patient's WBC such that, okay, you just multiply the WBC count by 50%, okay? So you get 50% of the WBC count and that's the absolute neutrophil count. Now take note that the normal absolute neutrophil count should be 2,500 and above. So definitely 1,000 is decrease. So the patient's having neutropenia, and that could actually potentially lead to a granulocytosis. You know for a fact that a granulocytosis is present when the patient begins to experience sore throat, fever, and body malaise. Okay, so they have a weak immune system. So ANC of 1,000, yes, we put a check. Now, total cholesterol of 250 milligrams. Once again, if you don't know the normal value of your cholesterol, it's difficult to answer. So your cholesterol, the normal should be less than 200 milligrams. Okay, and the level above 240 is considered high. So this level is definitely high. So remember, there's hypercholesterolemia. So we put a check. Triglyceride of 200, once again, you have to know the normal value of triglyceride. So triglyceride should be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. So triglyceride level of 200 is already considered high. So we put a check because there's elevated triglycerides in von Gerke disease. And definitely, what did we say? The hallmark sign is 
hypoglycemia. So definitely categorically speaking, hypoglycemia occurs when the blood sugar of the patient is 50 milligrams per deciliter and below. So we put a check. Okay, so that's how you process information which we have learned. So it's not enough that you know the values. It's not enough that you know the laboratory data. It's not enough that you know what the disease is all about. You have to know how to process the information. You don't memorize all the facts about the disease. That's an, an, a so basic way of preparing for the test. You have to know how to process the information. And there's nothing on the internet that would tell you how to process information. You can only do this if you have a mentor telling you how you will study these concepts. Okay? Okay. So let's move on. Okay, so what is the difference between a toddler and a tadpole? You know, <laughs> what's the difference between a toddler? You know, uh, I, I remember one of my mentors telling me that there's no such thing as a silly question if it is asked by a learner. Okay, that's what I learned when I did my master's in the States. There's no such thing as a silly question when it's asked by a learner. But look at this question. What is the difference between a toddler and a tadpole? <laughs> Maybe the spelling. So these two are actually so different. You're talking of a little child and you're talking of, well, the baby, what? The baby tadpole. <laughs> or the baby frog. You call it a froglet in the Philippines. Okay. So this is just actually to contextualize. The next thing that I'd like to highlight would be care of the toddler. Not the tadpole. It's care of the toddler. Okay, are we ready to know about what are the things that you have to know about the toddler? Okay, now I have given you a PDF file of this and please follow through. I'd like to highlight, okay? Now this also found in my book NRS, okay, on page 61. Those of you who have copies, please follow through. So remember, talk to the child in simple terms. Because the toddler can speak using three to four words as sentences. So simple terms means the toddler can now answer questions using a yes or a no. But this is the stage in which most of their answers to questions would be no, even if they mean yes. Okay? So this is the no, no, no stage. So talk to the child in simple terms. <laughs> Offer choices to the child to provide some control. This is especially useful when you're giving the medications. The choice should be, would you, should not be rather, should not be about whether they want to take the medication or not. But the choice should be definitely to lead them to take the medication. How do you go about this? Ask the child, would you want to take your medication with water or with juice? Or is it with juice or with milk? You're giving them a choice because you want to Provide them a safe <laughs> Next, do not live alone near the bathtub or swimming pool. Remember, even four inches of water in the tub or in the pail could actually drown the child because the toddler has not mastered, okay, the art and science of breathing when their face is submerged in water, not unless they've been to a swimming school. So it's very, very important if parents are given um, the, the instruction if they can have their children in a swimming school so that they learn how to breathe when their face is submerged in water, okay? Well, doubt and shame versus autonomy. This is actually the developmental task of the toddler. They want to be independent. That's why their play is usually parallel play. They play alongside another toddler independently, but they don't interact with their co-toddlers. They play with, alongside with them, but not with them. Okay. Next, learns about death beginning at age three. Before age three, children doesn't, they don't have a concept of death. But the realistic concept of death and dying occurs when the brain is mature. That's about age nine to 10, okay? And elimination patterns. Toilet training begins at 18 months. And finally, okay, rituals and routines. Now, one of the things that toddlers could do is that they begin to draw full circles at age three. Okay, their circles are so perfect at age three. And to compare them with a preschooler at age four, preschoolers at age four, they begin to learn to draw squares. So remember, squares have four corners, so age four. Okay, toddlers usually have, are able to draw perfect circles at age three. Now, my question is, which among these concepts, 
so many concepts do you need to remember for your test? I can only highlight three. This is the purpose of what we're doing. I'm giving you highlights so that it's not going to be difficult for you to study for your test. Okay. The first one would be, okay, toilet training. Okay. Question. When can we say that a toddler is already possessing the readiness skills for toilet training? Okay. Three things. Number one, you can observe that they begin to pull on their diapers, especially when it's wet or soiled. Number two, well, they begin to have behaviors like hiding to pee and hiding to poo. And, but the most important thing that you have to check is they are able to sit, okay, on their own, okay? So if they're able to sit and move up from, the, from a sitting position on their own, then they are now ready for toilet training okay so that's the first thing i'd like to highlight the second thing i'd like to highlight about toddlers is the fact that at age three they already have a complete set of 20 primary teeth or your temporary teeth and this has special implications for tooth brushing why because toddlers sometimes when you give them um toothpaste with flavors oh my god Forget about it. They would actually chew it like candies. Now, this is actually um, a problem because too much fluoridated toothpaste could actually lead to dental fluorosis that could stain the teeth of the child. So therefore, what needs to be used when you are talking about oral care in toddlers? Okay, your low fluoride toothpaste should be used and instruct them to brush the teeth at least twice a day. Now, when you say low fluoride, okay, it has something to do with how much of the fluorinated toothpaste is, you, is uh, allowed for the child. Pea-sized, okay? Sang maliit na toldo. Pea-sized, okay? Now, let's pay particular attention now. Um, what about for children younger than three years old? Are they allowed to use fluoridated toothpaste? It's better for children below three years old to use, okay, toothpaste that are fluoride-free so that they don't... Um, have they don't develop dental fluorosis now what if a child again let's have the what if attitude what if a child has cerebral palsy then the more that we have to emphasize oral or dental care because a child with cerebral palsy would usually receive your anticonvulsants specifically your dilantin and that a common side effect would usually be gingival hyperplasia that's why a child with cerebral palsy is very, very prone to dental caries. And that's the reason why you have to encourage them to brush their teeth properly, okay? So we've covered toilet training, we've covered oral care. And the third thing that I'd like to highlight uh, in the care of the toddler would be the toys that you need um, to enable them to express themselves, okay? To enable them to develop their social skills, okay? Now, there are a lot of questions. For the toddler, we give them push or pull toys. Anything that they can push, like a carriage with a doll, or they can pull, okay? Or anything that they can sort and insert, like different shapes. They can use actually large piece puzzles, okay? Don't give them the small piece puzzles. Even as adults are not able to do that. And of course, okay, the toddler can now ride a tricycle, okay? Not the tricycle that we have here in the Philippines, but the tri-bike that they use for kids. And definitely, they would learn how, they would love how to play with balls. Now, there's a red flag that I would usually like to highlight here. When a toddler usually doesn't want to play with balls, chances are the child could have autism spectrum disorder, okay? Because children with ASD, they don't like to play with balls. And playing with balls is typical of toddlers. So if you see that in a child, then that should be a red flag. Maybe you could have the child assessed. Okay, are you learning colleagues? I'm enjoying being with you today. Okay, my day is so productive when I'm doing this, okay? So now we've talked about the toddler, we've talked about von Gerke disease, we've talked about prioritizing. Now let's talk about ourselves, okay? <laughs> the impaired nurse now. Definitely, if you're preparing for the test, it has to have items or concepts related to the discipline. And this is one way of highlighting why I chose the concept of impaired nurse as part of our NCLEX quick fix session, okay? So let's begin. 
who is an impaired nurse? Well, an impaired nurse, simply put, is a nurse who is affected by either psychiatric illness, alcohol abuse, or addiction. Simple as that. And because of the psychiatric illness, alcohol abuse, and addiction, they are unable to meet the requirements. Okay? They are unable to align their behavior to the code of ethics, and they are uh, unable to observe the standards of the, the profession. So in other words, they are now impaired, okay? Cognitively, interpersonally, or their psychomotor skills. Now, what are the manifestations that you have an impaired nurse in your unit? You have inappropriate clothing, mood swings, very irritable, preoccupation with death and illness, absenteeism, they have um, lack of professionalism, okay? Increased personal phone time, rigidity, they are unable to change plans, exaggerated self-importance, and difficulty in remembering procedures and instructions. Now, sometimes these impaired nurses also have what is called the closed door syndrome. They love to go on break, you know, the smoking break, the coffee break, and they love to stay by their lonesome or alone, okay, in restrooms, okay? So that should raise a red flag. And if your patients who are supposed to receiving narcotics are complaining of pain, and yet the medical administration record shows that they have received their pain medication, maybe what was given to the patient is a placebo. And the narcotic was actually hmm, hidden by the impaired nurse, possibly, and they use it after. That's the reason why they have this closed door syndrome, okay? Now, here's a simple question. Which of the following interventions is appropriate when intervening with an impaired nurse? Select all that apply. So do not accuse, yes. Um, expect denial, yes. Intervene as early as possible, yes. You please do report it to the charge nurse. Never label your colleague, yes. Report your observation to the supervisor and advise your colleague to quit working. We don't do that, okay? Next, let's move on to lithium, okay. Now, there has been a lot of confusion, I do understand, on two points about lithium. One would be, one would be on the normal lithium level, because the normal lithium level actually varies. You have to consider the age of the patient and the phase of the treatment. And the second confusion is whether the manifestations are classified as a side effect, okay, or as a toxic effect. So that's a problem. And students would usually ask me, sir, do all medications have side effects? Of course, okay? All medications have side effects because medications with no side effects have probably no main effect at all. So even pills have side effects. And if you don't take pills, because you, you hate the side effects, you wouldn't have side effects, you would have front effects. <laughs> so what do you want, the side effect or the front effect? Okay, so let's talk about lithium now. Okay, so here's what I'm trying to point out, okay? When you're studying lithium, focus on the therapeutic and the toxic levels. Now, under therapeutic levels, you have to note the age of the patient. If the patient is below 65 or 65 years old and above, there's a difference. For adults below 65 years old, meaning they're not yet considered elderly, the acute dose should be 0 0.5 to 1.5 milliequivalent per liter. This is higher, and this is expected in the first three months of administration. Maintenance dose is 0 0.5 to 1.2 milliequivalent per liter. This is lesser, and this is usually expected after the first three months of administration, okay? Now, what about if you have elderly patients, 65 years old and above? The acute dose now is 0 0.6 to 1.0 milliequivalent per liter, and the maintenance dose is 0.4 or 0 0.8 milliequivalent per liter. One thing you have to remember, let's turn this into functional concept. For the elderly patient who's taking lithium, lithium should not exceed 1.0. Why? Because they have lesser excretion capabilities in the kidneys. Therefore, therefore, they have difficulty excreting the lithium. So, 1.2 is already considered as a toxic dose for the elderly patient. Therefore, how will you use that as a functional concept? When you see lithium levels, what's the first thing that you have to know? For you to label it as normal or toxic, check the age of the patient. 
So if that will be transformed into a question, which of the following is the priority of the nurse before giving lithium to a patient? Check the age, because the lithium level depends on the age of the patient. That's a priority of the nurse, okay? And after checking the age, monitor the lithium levels. Okay, now let's move on to the toxic levels. When the toxic level reaches 2 to 2.9, the priority should be to increase fluids because you have moderate toxicity. And this is the time that hemodialysis will be implemented. And when it's 3.0 milliequivalent and above, this is now what we call neurotoxicity. This is an emergency situation because the patient could go into seizure and coma. Okay? So in that case, if a patient is already having seizures, then that patient is taking lithium should be considered as a priority. But my question is, there's a question. My student asked me, so what about the patient who's taking lithium but exhibiting fine hand tremors and the other one who's exhibiting coarse hand tremors? Which would be my priority? Is it the patient who's exhibiting fine hand tremors or the patient who's exhibiting coarse hand tremors? Well, you have to know the difference. Fine hand tremors is a side effect of lithium. So it's expected. It's not indicative of toxicity. Coarse hand tremors, on the other hand, indicates toxicity. Okay, so who should you attend to first? The patient who's taking lithium with fine hand tremors or the patient who's taking lithium with coarse hand tremors? The answer, the patient who's taking lithium with coarse hand tremors. That's your priority. Now, what if one of the options is phrased like this? Which of the following should the nurse attend to first? Then you have a patient taking lithium with fine to coarse hand tremors. Okay, choose that. Because the fact that the tremors progress from fine hand tremors to coarse hand tremors simply means that from a side effect, the patient has now accumulated so much lithium in the body such that they're now manifesting a toxic level of lithium in the body. Okay, so let's move on. I hope you're learning. This is what this session is all about. The quick fix is about learning how to process information that you need to remember before you sit for your test. Okay. When there is mild to moderate lithium toxicity, it's usually manifested by diarrhea, vomiting, tremors, which is usually from fine, core, uh, fine hand tremors to coarse hand tremors, then muscle weakness and drossin. Mild lithium toxicity usually goes away on its own when you stop taking lithium and increase fluid intake. The question now is, which is your priority? To stop the patient from taking the lithium or increasing fluid intake? Once again, Mild lithium toxicity, just instruct the client to stop taking the lithium. Why do we need increasing fluid intake usually to three liters per day? Because lithium is a form of a salt, but it's the form of a salt that needs to combine with sodium for it to be diluted and exclusively excreted by the kidneys. That's the reason why you need high fluid intake for a patient taking lithium. Okay, for moderate lithium toxicity, now okay, it's usually treated with stomach pumping, bowel irrigation, IV fluids, hemodialysis, and monitoring of the vital signs. Okay, severe lithium toxicity is manifested by an elevated temperature, hyperthermia, seizures, slurred speech, rapid heartbeat, and of course, labile or low BP. Okay, now here's a question. Lithium side effects at the therapeutic levels includes, now what's the key word here? The word side. Okay, so what did we say? Side effects, fine hand tremors, yes. Polyuria, yes. Thirst, yes. Muscle weakness, yes. Headache and memory impairment. Yes. Now, what poor coordination. What about poor coordination? This is indicative of higher levels of lithium. Um, so, hindi ka mo na-admit, ma'am, sa pag-iwag. Hindi ba makal ka tumabulong ako supply sa gwa? Samtang na-admit ka mo? Ano? Okay. So, once again, let's remind our colleagues to please put your microphones in mute. Excellent. Okay. To summarize everything, let me show you this table. Side effects which are expected when a patient's taking lithium carbonate would be fine hand tremors. But once that fine hand tremors has become coarse tremors, then you have toxic effects. Okay? Okay. Next, side effects would include diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, 
Now, notice, when you have toxic effects, you have the word increasing diarrhea and vomiting. So that if it's only diarrhea and vomiting, that's just a side effect. If you have increasing diarrhea and vomiting, then that is actually a toxic effect, okay? Polydipsia, polyuria occurs both as side effects and toxic effects, but take note, edema is just a side effect and renal failure is actually considered as a toxic effect, okay? Vertigo is a side effect, it's expected, but ataxia or loss of balance, okay, could be considered toxic effects. And of course, when there's just difficulty concentrating, it's a side effect, disorientation is a toxic effect. Then metallic taste is a side effect, seizures and coma would be toxic effects. So it would help you out if you know the difference between side effects and toxic effects. Excellent. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Welcome, Patrick. You're late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's talk about Alport syndrome. What the heck is Alport syndrome? Okay. Now, let me just give you some preliminary concepts. This one thing I'd like you to remember. When you think of Alport syndrome, think about hematuria. Why? Because Alport syndrome, the main symptom is hematuria. But what is difficult is when you are asked a question like, which of the following symptoms could be found in both Alport syndrome and acute glomerulonephritis? The answer is definitely hematuria. You have hematuria and Alport syndrome, you have hematuria and acute glomerulonephritis. What's the difference? Okay, well, the cause. Acute glomerulonephritis is associated with um, prior infection with group A, beta hemolytic streptococcal um, organisms. Examples would be sore throat, impetigo, scarlet fever. So if you ask the child if they have had these types of infection before having hematuria, chances are the child would have acute glomerulonephritis. But if they did not have those kinds of infection, group A, beta hemolytic streptococcal infection, they didn't have it, and yet they had hematuria, then you begin to suspect Alport syndrome. Now, how do you go about assessing for the possibility of the child having Alport syndrome? Well, focus on genetic, possible genetic transmission. Okay, when we say genetic transmission, how is your Alport syndrome transmitted genetically? Well, it differs. About 80 to 85% of cases are considered X-linked, okay? So these are therefore transmitted by the mother to the son. So you would see Alport syndrome very, very frequently in boys. It's transmitted by the mother to the son, 80 to 85% X-linked transmission. Now, 15% of Alport syndrome are transmitted um, autosomal recessive pattern. What does that mean? Two parents should be carriers such that there's 25% chance of their children, whether male or female, of developing the disease, okay? And then the remaining 5% of cases of Alport syndrome are transmitted autosomal dominant, which simply means even only one parent carries the trait, there's a chance that the disease could be transmitted to either a male or a female offspring. So majority of the cases of Alport syndrome are seen in boys because this is X-linked transmitted, transmitted by the mother to the son. Okay, so having that in mind, okay, let's answer a question. After a child has been diagnosed with Alport syndrome, parents must be referred to which of the following members of the multidisciplinary team? Well, we know for a fact that it's genetically transmitted, so we need a geneticist, okay, definitely. So going back to that, you need the help of our functional concept. So they have genetic abnormalities, and it usually comes with hearing impairment, and there's usually fluid retention due to renal failure. So you need a nephrologist, and you have cardiovascular abnormalities. So if we apply this functional concept to answer the question, okay, here it goes. We need a geneticist, yes. We need an audiologist, yes. Usually genetically transmitted conditions would also have a corresponding impairment in uh, sensory functions like hearing, okay? Registered dietitian, yes, they have fluid retention. They usually have, okay, a problem related to 
uh, excretion of fluid. So you need to modify their diet. So we need a registered dietitian. Cardiologists, yes, usually genetically transmitted condition comes with uh, corresponding um, cardiac conditions. And of course, yes, okay, we need a nephrologist. Remember, they usually have hematuria. Now, here's one thing that we need to be cleared on. Does nutritionist mean the same as registered dietitian within the context of the NCLEX? No. Okay. Nutritionist is a professional or even a non-professional who claims to know about food. Anyone who claims to know about foods could claim to be a nutritionist. But one who is a registered dietitian means that the client met the professional requirement, including a licensure exam to prepare therapeutic diets. So therefore, the nutritionist is not a recognized member of the multidisciplinary team. You never put a check on an option that includes nutritionists when you're taking the NCLEX. So we put an X. So the answers are geneticists, audiologists, registered dietitian, cardiologists, nephrologists, nutritionists is not included. Okay, so let's move on. I hope you're learning. So at this point in time, I'd like to highlight a test taking key. What is actually the test taking key? Okay, the test taking key, repetition helps. If you would notice, I frequently repeat the concept that I'd like you to remember. Remember, repetition helps. Repetition helps. Okay. So we're just looking for our colleagues. Please be reminded to turn your microphones on mute, please. Okay. Look at the story of this lady, Teresa George. It's from the U.S. I never met her personally, but she sent me an email, very sweet email, thanking me for writing my books, which are available in the U.S. And she said, I nearly gave up after failing the NCLEX nine times. In my 10th time, I read NCLEX RN in a flash. Okay, so what did we say a while back? Repetition helps. But I'm not asking you to repeat it nine times as she did, but <laughs> the attitude is that she never gave up. Okay, so repetition is the key to success. Why? Remember, God has perfect timing. Never early, never late. But what you need to remember, it takes a little patience, it takes a lot of faith, but it's going to be worth the wait. So if you are in the same situation right now that everything seems to be not falling into its proper place, always remember God has perfect timing and he gives the hardest battle to his best soldiers. And feel good about being one of God's best soldiers during this time of pandemic. I know how difficult it is for us nurses to be at the front line of health services. We don't have a choice, but that's... Um, our sworn responsibility to participate in God's mission of preserving life. And that's very noble, okay? So always remember, if some things are not falling into their places at this point, God has perfect timing. It will come. Your time to shine will come, believe me. And you would just say, well, the delays are worth the wait, okay? Never say, it's not going to happen. Always believe it will happen. Probably not at this point, not yet, but it will. Okay? Not yet, but it will. Okay. Now, let's move on to the next concept that I'd like to highlight, and this is going to be atrial fibrillation. Okay? So, if you talk about atrial fibrillation. Oh, well, I'm just sorry for our colleagues. I think you received an email that says you have to change your name into full names before you are allowed entry into our, into our Zoom meeting. So please be mindful that your gadget should reflect your full names. Otherwise, uh, we won't be accepting those who have just like iPhone X10. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about atrial fibrillation. Now, when you're studying ECG, it's kind of difficult to remember if it's not simplified. Now, I cannot teach you in five minutes how to understand ECG. I have a full video on my site. It's called Gapus Mentors. And check on the ECG discussion, 
okay? It's very simplified, it's very specific, and it's just a little over an hour teaching you the dynamics, but that's ECG for test taking. It's not clinical ECG. Now, I can't teach you how to interpret ECG strips in five minutes, but what I can teach you is what you need to remember related to an ECG strip associated with atrial fibrillation. Two things. When you're studying atrial fibrillation, you have to be familiar with the characteristics, small P waves and irregular QRS. Second, you have to know which medications, not the ones that are indicated, but those that are contraindicated because it worsens the condition. Those are the two things I'd like to highlight as we discuss atrial fibrillation. I'm so happy all of you guys are, you know, adding up to our session. I will be doing this regularly. Come on. Okay. Those of you are having difficulty preparing for the NCLEX, stay calm. I'm here. Okay. This is the point in time that we have to help each other professionally. And I'm baguna po ito. My contribution. Okay. Let's move on. So for example, you have an item that pops out of your computer screen when you're sitting for the test, it goes this way. The ECG tracing below indicates, okay. What would be your first reaction? Let me guess. <laughs> Could be hitting your head in front of the computer screen and say, what the hell? I did not study this concept. Now, you will have to write down and enter your answer. And this is actually atrial fibrillation. What would tell you that it's atrial fibrillation? Look. The distance between the QRS complexes are not equal. So we call this irregular QRS. And look at the P waves. They have now become multiple. Okay? Multiple P waves have become so small, they are now called fibrillatory waves or F wave. The F wave that's, uh, sorry, the F wave that's small letters. Okay? So you have fibrillatory F waves and irregular QRS, you have atrial fibrillation okay now carry your functional concepts atrial fibrillation occurs when electrical impulses are fired by the atria in an irregular manner leading to irregular heart rhythm so atrial fibrillation is characterized by take note the qrs duration that's usually normal but you have an irregular rhythm an atrial rate between 400 to 600 P wave that has become F waves and the PR interval is not measurable. The only thing normal, therefore, in atrial fibrillation would be your QRS duration. All the rest are abnormal. Note that. That's a functional concept. Okay? So atrial fibrillation is caused by, you have this in your handout. Remember the code heart? Heart attack, high blood pressure, heart defects, damage. These are the most common causes. Heart conditions, emotional stress, abnormal heart valves, recurrent use of stimulants such as caffeine, smoking, and medications, and of course, thyroid hyperactivity. So it's not actually uh, a surprise if your patients with Graves disease or hyperthyroidism is going to develop atrial fibrillation as a complication, okay? Now, atrial fibrillation is manifested by, remember the code AFib, variety of heart-related symptoms like chest pain, lightheadedness, and dizziness, fatigue, irregular heartbeat, and breathing difficulty. Okay, management of atrial fibrillation is primarily focused on the prevention of stroke and heart failure. Let me tell you why. What did we say about your atrial fibrillation? The atrial rate, okay, normally the heart, okay, would actually contract and then relax at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute, okay? That's normal, cardiac reaction. What happens in atrial fibrillation? What did we say a while back? 400 to 600. So instead of the normal contraction and relaxation, it now quivers. So if the heart is just quivering, what happens to the blood? It's not gonna be pumped out. The blood remains within the heart. So blood stasis results, and that leads to clot formation. And when the clot forms, Eventually, it gets dislodged. It goes to one of the small arteries in the brain, strokes result, okay? So if that will be transformed into a question, you will be asked, which of the following patient is most at risk to stroke? The client with atrial fibrillation. Another question, if a patient has atrial fibrillation, what is a potential complication? Stroke or cerebral thrombosis or cerebral embolism? Another question. So to prevent the stroke in a patient with atrial fibrillation, which medication is usually given? 
your blood thinners like heparin to prevent clot formation. Next important thing that you have to remember, if your patient, okay, is having atrial fibrillation, why is there a need for MRI? There's a need for MRI because stroke could result, okay? And most stroke, the blood clots that causes stroke are cardiac in origin. Remember that? Most blood clots that causes stroke are cardiac in origin. So a patient with atrial fibrillation, therefore, is most at risk to stroke. That's a concept on prioritizing. Remember, we started with that concept and we're trying to integrate it every single concept that it could potentially influence how the concept is presented in the actual test. Okay, now the three broad goals in the management of atrial fibrillation includes the control of ventricular rate, minimizing thromboembolism and restoration and maintenance of normal sinus rhythm. Now to control the ventricular rate, um, these medications are given, verapamil, sorry, digoxin, metoprolol, propranolol, and for IV, procainamide, amiodarone. To minimize thromboembolism, you have aspirin, warfarin, dabigatran, and IV, heparin. Restoration and maintenance of normal sinus rhythm, you have kinidine, flecainide, profathinone, amiodarone, disoperamide, and sotol. I'd like to highlight two of these medications that helps maintain normal sinus rhythm, kinidine. Kinidine causes synchronism, and in synchronism, it's manifested by three groups that reflects the affectation of the ears, okay, the eyes, and the central nervous system. So in synchronism, associated with kinidine administration, patient would have tinnitus, blurred vision, and then see any symptoms like fever, headache, and then the patient would usually have dizziness. Okay, and then for sotalol, always remember a common side effect, okay, of sotalol could be finger edema. Those are just the two things I'd like to highlight in this concept. Remember, that's what NCLEX quick fix is all about. I'm trying to highlight what you need to know. Okay, drugs that may cause atrial fibrillation includes milrinone, atrophine, adenosine, and butamine. What's the implication? So which drugs may be contraindicated because it may worsen atrial fibrillation. One thing I'd like to highlight, atrophin. So atrophin increases the heart rate. It's a vagolytic agent. Therefore, since in atrial fibrillation, the atrial contraction rate is already 400 to 600, if you give atrophin, it would further increase it. So you question if the doctor orders atrophin. Okay, so let's move on. How does atrial fibrillation differ from atrial flutter? This time, this is a valid question. It's only the question that we had a while back. How is a toddler different from a tadpole? Remember? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, remember, flutter waves are present in both atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. The difference would be, okay, the flutter waves in your atrial fibrillation are smaller and the flutter waves in your atrial flutter would be bigger. That's why it's represented by the capital F, okay? Now, however, in atrial fibrillation, the QRS complex occurs irregularly, so the rhythm is irregular, whereas in atrial flutter, the rhythm is regular. So this is how it differs. Look, first, the QRS complexes here have different distances, Okay, so this is irregular. Look at in atrial flutter, it's almost the same. So that's regular QRS rhythm, okay? Next, the P waves here are small. So you have flutter waves that are very small. So you have your small F waves. The flutter waves here are big, such that the ratio of the P wave to the QRS is usually, normally it should be one P wave to one QRS. But here in atrial flutter, look, you have three P waves to one QRS. Sometimes you have two P waves to one QRS. So when you have bigger flutter waves, then think atrial flutter. If you have smaller flutter waves, then you think about atrial fibrillation. If you have small flutter waves plus irregular rhythm, that's atrial fibrillation. Big flutter waves plus regular rhythm, that's atrial flutter. Okay. 
So for atrial flutter, the rhythm is regular. The rate is around 110 beats per minute. QRS is usually normal. P wave is replaced with the multiple F waves or flutter waves. Look at the ratio. It's two F wave waves to one QRS or three F waves to one QRS. You've seen that a while back in the illustration. It's three F waves to one QRS. The P wave rate is 20 bits per minute. The PR interval is not measurable. Okay. So let's summarize. Okay. I'd like to highlight two things here. The rhythm and the P wave. In AFib, you have irregular rhythm and the P wave has now become indistinguishable and it's replaced by your small F waves. Okay. In atrial flutter, the rhythm is regular and your P wave is replaced with the bigger flutter waves. Okay. Manifest by the capital F waves. Okay. It's represented by the capital F. Okay. Here it's represented by the small f. Okay. So if it is irregular, small f waves, atrial fib. If it is regular, big f waves, atrial flutter. Okay. So here's another NCLEX quick fix test taking key. Get yourself inspired. I know at this point in time, some of you could be tired. Some of you could be saying, oh my God, uh, I need this, but I'm already sleepy. You know, I have like how many hours of duty, okay? Get yourself inspired. So I'd like to share with you. Well, these are the kinds of messages that I receive on my social media. This was actually last January. So I pass NCLEX in second attempt. I am very much thankful for your guidance. Must say from the beginning of the class till today, you and your team became my inspiration to success and will be always grateful to God who provide me chance to be student of most brilliant team I have ever known. Thank you. This is Swasti, okay? One of our nurses from, I think, Nepal, okay? So congratulations, Swasti. And more success for you. Like Swasti, you should be inspired, okay? So consider test taking as an adventure. Every time we're going to have this quick fix session, you say, I'm going, on an adventure. I'm going to something which I would love to do. Okay. Now, let's talk about this. The next concept that I'd like to highlight would be airborne precautions. Now, this is special meaning now because in most countries, they're adopting specific precautions. But take note, if you would ask me whether the NCLEX would contain items on COVID or not, I'll give you my expert opinion. This is my expert opinion. I'm not quoting anyone, my own expert opinion. Based from my observation of how they do it, no, they won't. Because when SARS actually came out, NCLEX has to, um, they initially came up with an advisory that they're going to include items after several months. Okay, so right now they're not coming up with an advisory that they're going to uh, include items on COVID. So. It simply means then they have yet to include those items. So in Tagalog, wala muna, none yet. But, but, okay, once again, let's have the what if mentality for the NCLEX preparation. If they're not asking about COVID, what if they would ask about other types of precautions? And this is the reason why we're going to talk about airborne precautions at this point. Okay. I hope you are learning, guys. Okay, so here's a functional concept. Implementation of airborne precautions require placing the patient in a private room with negative airflow. Now remember, when you're establishing priorities of which patient should be placed in a room with negative airflow if you only have one available, well, the CDC recommends that the patient with TB should be the priority for that private room with negative airflow, okay? Use of respirator mask, N95, N99, or N100 by the healthcare worker. Remember, that's by the healthcare worker. If the patient is brought out of the room, wearing surgical mask is required. So if you have a client with TB who's being brought out of the room for diagnostic testing, it's going to be the patient who should be wearing the surgical mask, okay? When an airborne isolation room is not available during an emergency, have all personnel wear N95 mask and pull the privacy curtain. Okay. Now, here are the things that I'd like to highlight about the conditions requiring airborne precautions. Remember the code MTVS, missiles, tuberculosis, varicella, and SARS, okay? So for missiles, you have to implement airborne plus standard precautions four days after the onset of rushes. For tuberculosis, 
consider as the priority for placement in a private room with negative airflow. For varicella, place in a negative airflow room until lesions are dry and crusted. If not available, use closed rooms and restrict entry of unimmunized persons. And for SARS, airborne precautions is the preferred for the duration of illness plus 10 days after the resolution of fever. An identified mask is required, but if unavailable, you can use surgical masks. Now, if you have gone through all this information, do you think you're already prepared for any eventuality that any of these conditions will be asked? Now, what if, let's integrate our what if mentality. What if there was a question about airborne precautions, but the diagnosis was not explicitly stated, meaning you didn't see missiles, okay? What you saw instead could be a group of symptoms that would tell you that the patient's having measles, like the presence of rush, conjunctivitis, cough, okay? Think measles. So on the NCLEX, there's such a thing as syndromic presentation of data. Now, you have to make sense out of the data that is being given to you. You have to make sense about how this set of information that you were given could, could assist you to arrive at a specific answer that's correct. Like for example, they may not place their tuberculosis, they would place a patient with low grade fever in the afternoon with coughing of blood strix sputum, then think about tuberculosis, okay? And when you see those group of symptoms, think about airborne precautions. Now, what about if you have a multiple choice with multiple response questions that's asking you which of the following conditions should be considered as priorities for airborne precautions. And that's simple. Fine with missiles, tuberculosis, varicella, and SARS. But once again, what about if they played with the concept, you didn't see missiles, you didn't see tuberculosis, varicella, or SARS, so what you saw could be a group of symptoms, syndromatic presentation of data. So you have to know how to make sense of those information. Okay, so if a patient exhibits mac maculopapular rash with fever and the three C's, cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, this should lead you to think that this patient with a Russian fever and cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis is suffering from missiles and therefore implement airborne precautions. That's what your functional concepts does. Uh, it, well, that's what your functional concepts would actually be so useful. These are one of the things that it does, okay? it would actually serve as a guide for you to remember your concepts and remember how these concepts are being asked on the test. Okay, now let's talk about contraceptives. Now, the first thing that comes to mind would be, how will I study concepts related to contraceptives? Okay, the first thing that I'd like to tell you guys, remember these colleagues, don't study contraceptives and be an expert of just a few. Just read through it and cluster the contraceptives according to patient concerns. So what do you mean by according to patient concerns? We have to study contraceptives based on how it's classified on textbook, that these are natural methods, these are um, um, artificial methods. I don't think that doesn't, that, that makes sense. It doesn't make sense because Patients would not be familiar with that classification. Remember, the NCLEX is very layman's. So therefore, okay, laymanize your concepts. How do we do that? So a concern of a patient would be, could you tell me which type of contraceptives will not require me to have a pre-sexual preparations? Because that interferes with, um, remember, that interferes with sexual intercourse, right? Yes. So if a patient would tell you, what are contraceptives that will not require me to have pre-sexual or pre-intercourse preparation? Well, you can talk about ligation, yeah? Once it's done, they don't have to prepare before, uh, with anything before sexual intercourse. Vasectomy, the use of injectables like Norplant, and the use of contraceptive patch. Okay, now, one of the most popular forms of contraceptives nowadays would be the use of contraceptive patch. Okay, the question is, the first question, what does it do? Well, like a pill, it also contains estrogen and progestin. One pack of contraceptive patch 
would actually contain three patches, okay, that you have to place on a specific body part, either at the buttocks, upper buttocks, okay, lower abdomen, upper body, but never on the breast and never on the face, okay? So upper abdomen, lower abdomen, upper buttocks, okay? Once a week, okay? For a total of three patches, meaning total of 21 days, you'll be wearing the patches. I have a question now. What if the patch got detached or got dislodged? What's your recommended action? Are you going to tell the patient to put on the patch, pick it up and put it on? Or are you going to tell the patient to restart the cycle? Or are you just going to tell the patient to replace the patch with a new one? Well, the answer, it depends. Okay. Now, the first thing that you have to tell a patient related to the use of contraceptive patches would be to choose a patch change day. And the patch change day should be the day or the time in the week that they will have to replace their patches. And that's done every seven days, okay? For a total of 21 days. So three patches in 21 days. Now, if the patient noticed that the patch actually got detached, but the patient noticed it within 24 hours, all the patient has to do is to pick up the contraceptive patch and attach it again. But what if it doesn't attach anymore? Okay, then reapply a new one. The question is, how long will the new one stay in place? Will I change it on my patch change day? Or start another cycle of seven days again? So example, if the patch change day of the patient is every Monday, so the patient plays the patch on a Monday, and on Wednesday, the patch got detached. So the patient is trying to attach it back, didn't attach, so the patient opened the new one and attached the new one. The question is, if that patch, the first patch, should remain in place from Monday to Sunday, and the old patch got detached on Wednesday, how long should the new patch remain? Is it going to be until Sunday or count seven days? That new patch that has been attached should only be placed there for the remainder of the week. Okay? So it seems, okay, if the patient's patch change day is on a Monday, you have to replace that new patch again on the next Monday. So which simply means, simply means you only use the new patch for the remainder of the week that the old patch should have completed, okay? Now, the next question is, what if the patch got detached and you didn't notice it? You didn't know. You have no knowledge when it got detached. So what you can do is to start another cycle. And this time, you have to choose a new patch change day. And within that period that you don't have the contraceptive patch, you have to make sure that you have to use another form of contraceptive. Okay, so let's have a sample. Which of the following is a natural method of contraception? Select all that applies. Permislide, definitely is not natural. Basal body temperature and cervical secretions, that's natural. Lactation amenorrhea, that's natural. Use of diaphragm is not. Calendar method, that's actually natural. And cervical cup is not. Okay, now let's talk about your percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube fitting. Okay, now what will you notice here? You have the tube that's actually directly inserted into the stomach. So primarily the purpose is to provide nutritional supplementation to patients with obstruction in the esophageal area. Okay, now there are two sets of parts of the tubes that I'd like to highlight. We have the external parts, okay? Okay, we have the adapter and the tubing clumps, okay? Then you have here on this part, okay, the part where the tube enters the skin, you have the external bumper, okay? And, the, and when we move inward, we also have an internal bumper. What is the purpose of those bumpers? Those bumpers are usually um, used to hold the tube in place, okay? And notice you have here the mushroom-shaped 
catheter tip that serves as an anchor. Okay? Now, what concept do you need to remember for peg feeding tube? Okay? The first one. How frequent should I check? Okay? For gastric residual volume. Okay? The question is, how frequent should you check for gastric residual volume? Within the first 48 hours that the tube has been used, you have to check gastric residual volume every four hours. But after the first 48 hours, then you have to check it every six to eight hours. So that's approximately three times a day. Question now. Can I use gastric residual volume as my benchmark data for continuing and stopping the patient's feeding? The answer is yes. But the next question is, how much gastric residual volume could be considered as a benchmark amount for me to stop, okay, your peg feeding? Because, because it simply means that when gastric residual is more than the benchmark figure, the patient is no longer absorbing the feeding. Okay, now remember, ASPEN, or the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, okay, they have a guideline and they said that for critically ill patients, do not stop enteral or peg feedings, okay, if the gastric residual volume is less than 500 ml. In other words, if you aspirate the gastric residual volume before you feed the patient, and what you've aspirated is less than 500 ml, continue feeding the patient. But if it is more than 500 ml, then hold feeding the patient. Why? It simply means that the patient's not absorbing the feeding. But the question is, that's based on ASPEN, okay? Clinically speaking, okay, there are some literature, literatures that actually identifies the figure to be at 250 ml. Okay, that's our benchmark figure. What does that mean? Okay, if the gastric residual that you aspirated is more than 250 ml, what do you do? Reinfuse the 100 ml and then flush it with 30 ml water and then hold feeding for one hour and then recheck if you have more than 250 ml. But if the gastric residual volume is less than 250 ml, reinfuse the gastric residual volume and continue feeding the patient. So what's the benchmark now for decision making? 250 ml. If the gastric residual is less than 250 ml, continue feeding, okay? If the gastric residual is more than 250 ml, reinfuse the 100 ml, flush it with 30 ml water, and then do not feed the patient for one hour, then reassess. Okay, so the magic figure now is 250 ml. Less than 250 ml, continue feeding. More than 250 ml, we infuse the 100 ml, flush it with 30 cc of water, and then check after one hour. Okay, now, let me just allow these two classmates of yours to enter our discussion room. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Here's an NCLEX RN style question. Percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy is a surgical opening into the stomach made through the skin using a flexible lighted instrument, an endoscope pass orally into the stomach to assist with the placement of the tube and security in place. Arrange the steps of the procedure by dragging the items on column A and placing them on column B in the correct sequence. Look at this question, guys. If you go through the options, there are two options here that may would make it difficult for you to decide. And you would usually ask yourself, which should come first, positioning the patient or hand washing? See, that's what I'm trying to highlight. If we don't identify which should come first, then all the rest of the steps would actually lead you to an incorrect arrangement. Therefore, it's very crucial to resolve these two. Remember, this is how you think about it. If you wash your hands and then you elevate the head of the bed, that could simply mean you've contaminated your hands again when you touch the head of the bed. So it's better to position the patient first before washing your hands and preparing the fitting, okay? So 
Before each feeding, the tube must be checked for patency. It should be free from obstruction in legs. Stomach contents measured. Remember, what's our benchmark um, figure? It's 250. If it's less than 250 ml, gastric residual volume, what do we do? Okay, so we reinfuse 100 ml and then flush it with 30 ml water. And then after that, hold feeding for one hour and then reassess. But if the gastric residual volume is less than 250 ml, we continue the feeding. And then, of course, check on the markings to make to make sure it hasn't moved. So the steps, first, elevate the head of the patient, 30, 45 degrees, wash the hands, check the gastric residual, administer the feeding, flush the tube with 30 ml of water. Okay, so we go back and let's arrange the options. So elevate the head of the pit, this is drag and drop, wash your hands, check the gastric residual, administer the feeding, and flush the tube with water. Exit! <laughs> now we got it. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about VAD. VAD is the opposite of good. No, <laughs> of course. I'm just kidding. Okay. This is your VAD, uh, venous access devices or VAD. Okay. Now, your VAD are usually flexible and it's used for uh, longer periods of time, especially if patients would need like transfusion of fluids or blood. And then, okay, you have to pay particular attention on the placement. It's either um, the axis could either be on the chest or on the neck. Now, are there any condition that contraindicates the use of VAD? Yes, for patients with cellulitis, for patients with blood clot, or for patients with... Um, septicemia, okay? The use of VAD could actually potentially worsen these conditions, okay? So let's move on. Oh, sorry. So VAD can be used in chemotherapy, okay? Now, venous access devices are most often used for the following purposes, select all that apply. So administration of medications, antibiotics, chemotherapy drugs, yes. Administration of fluids and nutritional compounds or hyperalimentation, yes. Transfusion of blood products, yes. Multiple blood draws for diagnostic testing, yes. Remember that, you have that in your uh, learning resources. Next, totally implantable venous access ports or TVAPs are valuable instruments for long-term intravenous treatment of patients with cancer. But implementation and use of these devices are each associated with complications. In addition to the perioperative problems, long-term complications can arise, including select all that apply. Catheter malfunction is a yes. Venous thrombosis is a yes, infection is a yes, complications, port complications is a yes, and extravasation injury, yes, all of this could occur. Okay, now let's talk about serotonin syndrome. Okay, now why do we even have to learn about serotonin syndrome? Now take note class that, okay, the first line of treatment in clients with depression would be the use of your SSRIs. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or SNRI, serotonin or epinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Okay, so in other words, since depression is possibly increasing nowadays due to the pandemic, we have to remember about the first line of treatment of depression, and that's your SSRI or SNRI. And in both conditions, okay, serotonin syndrome could actually result. Okay, and why is it significant for us to even like spend some minutes discussing about serotonin syndrome because this condition is potentially life-threatening, it's highly fatal, okay? And this could be triggered when you have drug combinations as treatment of depression. Like for example, if SSRI is, if SSRI is given with levodopa, that could trigger serotonin syndrome. If SSRI or SNRI is given to a patient who is taking lithium, that could also trigger serotonin syndrome. Now, what is the main problem in serotonin syndrome. The main problem is that you have an increased stimulation of the central nervous system. Therefore, there's an acute response in terms of the vital signs. So the temperature increases, so you have hyperthermia, and then the reflex response would also increase. You have hyperreflexia, okay? Okay, so now let's move on. Okay, serotonin syndrome causes, what are the signs and symptoms of serotonin syndrome? You have, remember the code cramps. Okay, let me just admit your classmate, okay? Confusion, rapid heart rate and high blood pressure, agitation and muscle twitching, muscle rigidity, diarrhea, diaphoresis and dilated pupils, and of course, shivering. Okay, now, 
you would notice that you have here muscle rigidity, okay? You also have here diaphoresis. And I told you a while back that the vital signs would increase. You have hyperthermia, high blood pressure. That is very similar to what? Another syndrome. That is very similar. Those group of symptoms, those three, diaphoresis, muscle rigidity, and increased temperature and vital signs, those are very similar to the symptoms of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The difference, neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurs in patients who are being given antipsychotics, okay? However, serotonin syndrome occurs in patients who are being given antidepressants, specifically your SSRI and SNRI. Therefore, how do we utilize the data or the information that we know to answer questions on the test? Okay, so what is your priority if a psych patient exhibits, who is undergoing treatment, exhibits diaphoresis, muscle rigidity, and an elevated temperature? What do you need to check? Check the diagnosis. If the patient is depressed and having treatment for depression, suspect serotonin syndrome. If the patient is having schizophrenia or any other form of psychosis and the patient's receiving antipsychotics, then the presence of diaphoresis, muscle rigidity, and elevated vital signs could mean neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Okay, so before you label a condition, whether it's serotonin syndrome or neuroleptic malignant syndrome, okay, check the patient's diagnosis, okay? So if your diaphoresis, muscle rigidity, and elevated vital signs are associated with the treatment of depression, chances are that's serotonin syndrome. Am I making sense? Thank you. Affirm me, colleagues. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we need that to a good pat on the back. Okay, it's a psychological paycheck of what we're doing. Okay, so here's a simple question. Which of the following manifestations occur in serotonin syndrome? Well, we've talked about heavy sweating, we've talked about headache, we've talked about goosebumps, because that's actually reflective of increased activity of the central nervous system. Then we've talked about, no, we didn't talk about constipation, we talked about the reverse of that, diarrhea, and what, do you remember? You have increased vital signs. It has to be hypertension and hypotension. Excellent. You're learning fast, okay? Now, ha, 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 ha. Let's focus on this concept. This time, the hearing impaired. A lot of people would usually ask me, which type of patients would usually receive hearing aid, okay? Would all patients who are hearing impaired would be um, receiving a hearing aid to improve on their condition? Actually, it depends on the type of hearing impairment whether it's conductive or sensory neural. Because if it's sensory neural, there's usually nerve damage, and it's more important that the patient would seek treatment from the physician before using a hearing aid. Okay, so um, let's talk about what could be a potential question related to this concept. Here's a question. Which of the following interventions can facilitate communication with a hearing impaired client? Okay. So it's asking us to identify interventions on how to communicate with the hearing impaired client. First, the position is very important. Face the client as you talk, okay? And take note, these are, this will have a very special implication for male nurses. When, you're the, when you have a patient or when you're taking care of a patient who is hearing impaired, kindly shave, okay, your beard and mustache, okay? You have to be clean shaven as when you cover the lips, it would prevent them from lip reading you. Okay. So always shave your mustache and your beard. Okay. You have to be clean shaven. Direct light on the client's face. Of course you don't do that. Okay. The glare would definitely irritate the patient. Avoid smoking and gum chewing while talking. You don't do that when you have a, um, a patient with a hearing impairment, because when you're chewing gum and you're talking to the patient, Okay, you would not be able to enunciate the words clearly. Shave mustache and beard before the interaction for male nurses, yes. Use pictures and drawing to help the client understand you, yes. Don't talk through a yawn, definitely yes. Okay, now, what if, let's use our what if NPLEX mentality. I've been telling you to develop that kind of mindset 
ask yourself, what if? What if the question would ask me now about what should I tell a patient who is using, who, who is hearing impaired and is using hearing aid on how to clean the hearing aid, okay? Because there's, there are issues like, is it all right to rinse the hearing aid in warm water? Is it all right to use um, alcohol or hand sanitizers to clean the hearing aid? Okay, let's be clarified on those issues. First, you don't soak the hearing aid. What you can soak would be the ear molds of the hearing aid. Remember the plastic that holds the hearing aid? That's something that you can soak in clean and soapy water, but not the hearing aid itself. Okay. Second, avoid using hand sanitizers and alcohol to clean the hearing aid. Use a dry cloth or a soft brush or a toothpick to examine, okay, and then pick out the wax that got themselves attached to the hearing aid. So you can use soft brush, you can use toothpick, you can use dry cloth, and you never soak the hearing aid. Okay, that's how the hearing aid is cleaned. Now you could be asking me, um, what's the probability that this concept will be asked? Remember what I told you a while back, the NCLEX is very layman's. So laymanize your concepts. Make it centered on, not on what you need to learn as a learner, but make it centered on what patients would want to know about their condition. So once you turn your focus in terms of the concepts that matters to the patient, then you're on the right track. You never use yourself as the basis for what you need to learn because that's just being narcissistic. You're too self-centered. That's a way to do end clicks. The way to do end clicks is focus on what my clients need to learn, what are the issues that they need to be cleared on, and I have as a nurse the responsibility to clarify those issues for them. That's our role. Okay, so that's the end of session one.